Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to South Talks. My name is Jody Skipper, and I am on the University of Mississippi's Faculty in Anthropology and Southern Studies. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture and its director, Dr. Katie McKee. Today, we have the privilege of having San Antonio, Texas native and landscape architect and architect Everett L. Fly with us today. After studying architecture at the University of Texas at Austin, Mr. Fly became the first African-American graduate of the master's program in landscape architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where he began to think through some of the field's gaps related to the African-American built environment. He has continued to do that work for over 40 years. Mr. Fly is a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects and has contributed to historic preservation projects in 17 states and the District of Columbia. He received a Texas Hero of Preservation Award in 2020 from the Conservation Society of San Antonio. In addition, President Barack Obama awarded Mr. Fly with one of 10 National Humanities Medals in 2014 for his body of work, which preserves the integrity of African American places and landmarks. He currently resides in San Antonio with his wife, Rosalinda. We welcome Mr. Fly, who will be, now begin his talk titled Building Activism, Landscape Architecture, and Stewardship of African American Studies. After Mr. Fly finishes his talk, we will have some time for Q&A that will last until about 1.15 p.m. Thank you all and welcome. Thank you for that introduction, Jody, and uh, thank everyone for um, being here with us this afternoon. Uh, it's a great privilege to get to ad address you, and uh, there's quite a bit to share. So I'm going to uh, start my screen. There we go, start my screen and uh, uh, go through this. I, I hope you'll have some questions at the end. Um, the questions for me, the questions and answers are the, uh, the best part of this. Uh, so um, uh, let me just go ahead and, uh, and begin. Um, as you heard in the introduction, my work has uh, spanned several decades and my approach is uh, interdisciplinary. In other words, I work with historians, archeologists, folklorists, uh, people that are interested in food waste, sociology, uh, urban studies, law, political science, digital technology, planning, environmental design, and of course, uh, landscape architecture uh, and architecture. And I came into this uh, during my graduate work at the School of Design uh, because I was really curious about uh, what contributions African Americans had made to, uh, to the built environment. So that, that's my approach is uh, through historic preservation and using all the tools and leverage uh, uh, possible through those uh, disciplines. So I wanna give you two, uh, two examples. Um, I'm gonna have to move through them quickly because uh, both of them have uh, quite a bit of depth, but um, I think they give a good uh, representation of uh, some of the issues and uh, the opportunities that uh, we face in, uh, community planning and preservation, and especially in uh, what's occurred in recent times, um, uh, environmental justice and, and equity. Um, so I'm gonna start in San Antonio, um, you know, not just because it's my home, but uh, because of this particular example and um, the, you know, kind of the way it's developing across the United States. Uh, so the, this first example is, uh, it's a historic African American cemetery. And uh, you can see the gentleman here that's uh, walking, that's uh, Major J. Mike Wright, US Air Force retired. And Major Wright's, this is a school here, an elementary school. And he lives in a, it's a Northern subdivision of San Antonio. And <clears throat> Major Wright noticed uh, over the years in walking his children to school, he noticed this, this overgrown lot. And so he started um, doing um, kind of amateur uh, deed research. 
and the deed research produced or yielded this plat that you can see here. And you can see the residential subdivision lots around it, but you can see that this in this green area is clearly labeled um, as, a, as a cemetery. Uh, it turns out that this, not just this cemetery right here, but all this property surrounding it was owned by <clears throat> former enslaved, uh, enslaved people, the Hockley, Clay, and Friedman family. And when you look at this 1939 aerial, uh, you can see this was farmland uh, all, all around here. Uh, and here's the cemetery and the Hockley farm. You can see the little outbuildings and you can see the, this was a, a gravel road at the time, the access to the cemetery. But as the cemetery was built, uh, or as, excuse me, as the subdivision was built up around it, uh, the residents, uh, lost track of what was there. Uh, the last burial in this cemetery was in the 1970s. And uh, when Major Wright, there's Major Wright uh, looking over the fence, when he called me, you can see this is the way the cemetery looked uh, here and here. And uh, so I decided to call the city of San Antonio. Uh, we're fortunate to have a, a formal office of historic preservation. And the Office of Preservation is connected to our, what we call development services. So if you're gonna build anything in San Antonio, uh, a building permit, uh, residential or commercial, you have to go through that process. Uh, the lady right here at the time, she was the city archeologist, that's Kay Hines. And the lady here was the president, uh, former president of the San Antonio Conservation Society. So the Conservation Society is a grassroots organization uh, that has lots of uh, volunteer resources, excuse me, in working with projects like this. But Kay Hines, the city archeologist was the key in this uh, because in Texas, uh, cemeteries come under the, what they call the, the Ant Texas Antiqu Antiquities uh, Law. Um, and as you can see, this was 2016. This is what the cemetery, the entrance and the property looked like in 2016. Uh, by 2018, between 2016 and 18, we did uh, more deed research, uh, oral interviews, uh, and investigation, and we were very certain that this was this was in fact a dedicated cemetery. So we uh, organized a cleanup, a volunteer cleanup, uh, in the fall of 2018. We had more than a hundred volunteers came from all parts of the city, uh, and as, again, you can see in the background how dense the vegetation was. The, uh, the city, what we call solid waste management. Uh, these are the people that pick up, uh, the department that picks up garbage and trash uh, here in San Antonio. Uh, they got wind of this and I was surprised they called me and they said, if, if we could get the brush out of the cemetery, if we could get it to the, to the collector street and pile it up, they would send the solid waste trucks with the pickup claw and the, the big transit truck and um, haul the brush away at no charge. Uh, so uh, over the year from 2018 to 2019, uh, we were able to get collected uh, more than 300 cubic yards of brush and get it hauled out of the, the cemetery. Uh, in the process of cleaning up in 2019, we began to find uh, pieces of uh, uh, metal, uh, uh, even you can see right there, it's hard to see, but a cross, a handmade cross. And then we began to notice a uh, placement of native stone, uh, placement and arrangements or patterns that couldn't be natural. It, it indicated that uh, some, some human, some person had placed the stones. Uh, through oral, oral interview, we were able to learn that the cemetery had been desecrated. Uh, one of the archeologists um, happened to live in the neighborhood when he was a, a, a teenager. And he said he remembered going to the cemetery and there were actually headstones uh, there. But by the time we got there in 2019 to do this work, uh, there were just a few artifacts left. Uh, so we were able to get uh, Texas A&M at College Station to send uh, two teams of students down. The, the first team uh, came, again, this is 2019, and they did uh, ground penetrating radar scans to help us uh, try to identify and find uh, the location of the graves because once again, the cemetery had been desecrated and uh, there were no headstones left. 
Uh, so this is Professor Mark Everett and his uh, team of students and uh, uh, the ground penetrating uh, radar equipment. And they uh, staked out a grid and uh, it took them about two and a half days to uh, survey the entire cemetery. The, the cemetery is, a, is an acre and a quarter, 1.25 uh, acres. We were also able to get um, uh, Professor Kevin Glowacki, that's him there, and his students, graduate students, to come out and do what we what they call a LIDAR uh, scan or a light detection and ranging scan of the surface, ground surface of the cemetery. Uh, the idea was to take the LIDAR scan uh, digital data and overlay it on the ground penetrating radar GPR digital data and see if we could pick up what, uh, what the uh, archaeologists and uh, geotech engineers call anomalies. Uh, in other words, where are there depressions and rises in the ground and uh, see if we could pick up uh, some patterns from that. We, we were able to find some patterns uh, and uh, as we gradually uh, clean up by hand, we hope that we'll be able to match uh, what we see physically with those, uh, those scans. Uh, also, the UTSA Center for Archaeological Research did a um, surface investigation and uh, report. And this is just a, the cover of the report and a page out of the report. And the UTSA group was able to find these um, uh, old aerial photographs from 1929, 39, 55, 66, 73, and 86. So you can see here the outline of the cemetery and the little blotches there were, uh, were vegetation. And uh, again, you can see the same kind of indications or, or suggestions there. Uh, again, in 1955, you can see the vegetation. Um, and even in 1966. Uh, in 1973, however, the site begins to change in character. You can't see the vegetation anymore. And by the time the subdivision gets going, uh, in 86, uh, all of you, you can see all the vegetation has, grown, has been uh, removed. The last uh, descendant, uh, living descendant to live on the Hockley uh, farm property was 1975. So the, the uh, black family had occupied this site for more than 100 years. Uh, we were able to find through uh, census research and asking around the community, we were able to find descendants, actual descendants of the Hockleys. And uh, this, is, this is late 2019 after we've gotten the cemetery cleared, you can see it's quite different. And when we did get it cleared, you can see the post here and the post here, uh, these two gentlemen were able to verify that those were the, the gate posts that they remember seeing when they came as young men. Uh, the gentleman on the left is Mr. Zelder Clay, and um, he's not, he's now uh, in his early 90s, and this is Mr. Belmill Clay, he's in his late 80s. Uh, Mr. Zelder here in the kind of pink colored shirt uh, said that when he was a young man, he helped, he actually helped uh, bury uh, folks in the cemetery uh, because this, this site is located about uh, 13 miles north of downtown San Antonio. And so in the 1930s and 40s, and he said even some in the early 50s, uh, the family did not always have the, the funds to, uh, to allow the uh, funeral home to uh, you know, do the burial. So the family would do the burial he said they would dig the graves uh, after work, sometimes uh, into the uh, into darkness, and that they would use uh, the headlights of the cars and the trucks and some lanterns and flashlights so that they could see what they were what they were doing. Uh, but he did say that there was no uh, geometric pattern to the burials, um, and that their grandmother it was their grandmother who actually knew where everyone was buried, but uh, no one thought to. Uh, uh, to make the, uh, like a roster, a cemetery roster and a plot plan to know where everyone uh, is located. Uh, the photograph uh, here on the right, uh, you can see Mr. Zelda and Mr. Belmill standing. And uh, because once we got the brush cleared, we uh, discovered this fence in the background 
and this shed. And Mr. Belmo and Zelda, when they got to this point, as we were walking the site, they said that they remembered the site being bigger, uh, being larger uh, in the direction of this shed and this, this house. Uh, so I was able to get, uh, excuse me, I was able to get a um, friend of mine who's a surveyor to do a survey and I'll, I'll come to that uh, in a moment. But in the process of doing the oral interview with uh, the Clays, uh, they told me that their great, great grandmother, Jane Warren, who was a, a former enslaved person, uh, actually sold cattle on the land. And we were able to go to the Bear County Spanish archives and find uh, here on the left, this is Jane Warren's uh, cattle brand certificate uh, dated 1875. Um, and so in order to provoke thought and get people uh, interested uh, uh, in the project, uh, I came, out, came up with the idea of putting Jane's brand on a cap. And so whenever we do something at the cemetery or uh, have a related event, uh, uh, we use that um, kind of as a uh, information and uh, marketing piece. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, this is the fence that uh, where Mr. Zeller and Mr. Velma were standing, and this is the, the shed. And uh, you can see, of course, that this fence is, it's not a straight line. And uh, I've even began to uh, recognize, you know, doing field work that something was out of whack. So the, the surveyor, this is the, the certified surveyor, this is given surveying. They went all the way out to the, to the benchmarks, uh, station points for the subdivision and did the survey. So you can see this is the easement to the cemetery here. Uh, the green area, of course, is the cemetery. And then these two colored plots here are the encroachments that they were able to verify. So this lot, residential lot here had move their fence from this point back to this point, this lot move their fence from here back to there. And the total of this, the two pieces together to two encroachments is, is a little bit more than 6,000 square feet. So I began to work with the uh, city of San Antonio uh, subdivision office. Uh, it took us about, well, two years to negotiate with the owners because these two property owners bought the property from, um, uh, the previous homeowners. Uh, in other words, they bought the property without a real estate agent or a real estate company. Uh, so they bought it without uh, having a land survey. And uh, that's what uh, continued this encroachment into these uh, areas. So we were able to finally ne negotiate with the two landowners. This is the shed. Uh, we were able to get a crew and they literally put logs underneath. You can see they jacked up the shed put logs underneath and to be as gentle as possible, we actually, you can see they actually moved it, uh, moved it by hand. Um, and that, so the movement from its original position here to the final location uh, was about 70 feet uh, out away from the cemetery. So the, once the fence is moved, this is the new fence. You can see the post for the old fence the post for the old fence here, the post for the old fence here, the new fence here on the right, and you can see how much area 6,000 square feet uh, includes. Uh, the city archaeologist uh, believes that there are, there are definitely some burials uh, in this area, and we hope to be able to do some more LIDAR and um, GPR scans uh, to verify that. Uh, and so standing at the far north end of the cemetery and looking uh, far south end rather than looking north, uh, you can see here, oops, you can see here and here and here where that um, illegal fence was located. And in the foreground, you can see a little bit of uh, how much land um, uh, was in the encroachment. The, uh, the second example I wanna use is uh, a historic black town. Um, and again, I've had the good fortune to um, be able to work with this community for uh, now a little bit more than 30 years. And it's, uh, it's Eatonville, Florida. Uh, of course, here's a map of Florida. Uh, Eatonville is in Orange County. Uh, Miami uh, is down in this direction. And uh, Daytona Beach is right up here northeast 
uh, of Orlando. And then this map of um, Orange County, uh, you can see that Eatonville is in the northern portion of Orange County uh, in the opposite direction from Disney and the, the theme parks. Uh, many people uh, know Eatonville because it's recognized as the childhood home of uh, the Harlem Renaissance writer Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, Hurston lived there as, a, as, a, as I said, as a child, but uh, those of you who uh, know literature and uh, uh, you know, African-American history will recognize uh, that Eatonville was the setting for Zora's books, uh, Mules and Men, Dust Tracks on the Road, uh, and so forth. Uh, this map I found in the Orange County uh, clerk's office and uh, the road right here along the southern edge of this township, uh, this, this was originally a, a Native American or indigenous American migratory trail. In other words, they would use this path to go across Orange County uh, as they migrated uh, looking for uh, uh, food and uh, for hunting ground. And these two lakes right here are the lakes that uh, appear in Zora's books and uh, form a, a unique part of the Eatonville landscape. Um, additional research uh, uh, verified that, uh, that Eatonville was, was established in, uh, in 18, uh, I'm sorry, 1887. Um, it's recognized as one of the oldest incorporated black towns in America. And this was important because uh, if a black town could incorporate, uh, they had the right to own and hold property, they had the right to education, they had the right to vote, the right to choose their trade or profession, the right to seek and hold professional office, and the right for public assembly because the mayor was black, the police chief was black, the fire chief was black, the town council was black and they could make their own uh, decisions. Uh, in the process of doing the research, I came across these two photographs. This is one of the early mayors, Joe Clark in 1905. Uh, and it, you can clearly see it actually says, Joe Clark had a pineapple farm or plantation. Uh, Dr. Booker T. Washington sent uh, uh, one of his graduates to Eatonville uh, in 1897. Uh, Russell Calhoun was a graduate of Tuskegee and was sent to Eatonville to start the Hungerford School. And you can see the early uh, school building, the main building uh, there in Eatonville. Uh, so when I went to Eatonville and began to ask uh, the town residents about this history, uh, it, was, it was hard for them to, to tell me where things were located. Some people said they remembered where Zora lived when she lived there. Some people said they remembered where Zora lived uh, when uh, she came back to visit. So I was able to get uh, uh, members of the community to sit down with me. And as you can see it, we recorded the, the oral interview. And then I put this map on the wall and asked them to, to recount their, their memories of place. You know, where, were, where did people live? Uh, which paths or routes or streets did they take to get to one place or the other. Uh, and they produced this map and we, we annotated the map and this end of the town is where the Hungerford School, uh, where it sat. And that photograph that I showed you a moment ago go of the main building, that's the, that's the main building. That was where it was located um, in Eatonville. Also in the process of doing uh, uh, the research, uh, I did, it was a revelation that, that there was still a lot of gardening and uh, farming going on because the lots are pretty big in Eatonville. Uh, the one on the left, those are, those are greens uh, there at the, in the foreground. And then in the background is uh, sugar cane. And uh, that's Mr. Ruford Shepherd, Shepherd. I call him the cane master of Eatonville uh, because he could tell you how to grow cane um, from uh, the stems and the cuttings, you know, all the way up to the, uh, the harvesting. But there are also uh, vernacular gardeners, uh, a large number of vernacular gardeners in Eatonville. And we put together uh, this yards and gardens primer to help document that and to continue, help them to continue. Uh, but many people now know Eatonville because of the Zora Neale Hurston Festival of the Arts and the Humanities. And this is one of the major steps that they've taken in their uh, efforts for stewardship. 
and the uh, Zora Festival before uh, the pandemic uh, had grown to be uh, a week-long festival. Uh, the average attendance was more than 100,000 people from all over the world. And um, uh, it included arts, uh, literature, folklore, uh, dance, uh, performance art, and even uh, this is Miss Ella Dinkins uh, with one of her handmade quilts. Uh, but one of the more important um, uh, uh, works for stewardship at Eatonville has been the educational aspect. And they've worked hard, you can see, to, to get everybody from the young kids to the high school kids to uh, this group here on the uh, bottom right is a group of K through 12 teachers. They came to Eatonville, you can see, in 2008 because all of these teachers were using and are, have continued to use uh, Zora Neale Hurston's uh, books in their classes. And so the Florida Humanities uh, uh, set up uh, three groups that came to Eatonville over a summer, uh, one group every, uh, four, every three to four weeks. And we would give them actual, an actual walking and physical tour of Eatonville so that when they did the teaching, they could uh, help their students understand what the real place uh, was like. Uh, and the last thing um, uh, related to stewardship that we're doing here in San Antonio is, is the organization of the San Antonio African-American Community Archive and Museum. Uh, we organized this in 2017 and because there was literally no, uh, no dedicated uh, organization for African-American history. You could go to uh, a university or a uh, uh, a museum collection that might have had a, a section or uh, uh, a few documents on African American history, but uh, we organized this to specifically focus on uh, African American history and use uh, digital collection techniques um, uh, for our work. Uh, so the building that they're standing, this group, our founding group is standing in front of is the, the home of the Samuel uh, and Lillian Sutton family. And the portion to the left was built in 1896 uh, by Samuel Sutton. Uh, some of you might not know Samuel, but he was, he was one of the first uh, African-American school teachers to come to San Antonio uh, after the Civil War. But others of you might recognize uh, one of Samuel's uh, sons was Percy Sutton. And Percy Sutton was the borough president uh, in New York City. Uh, he was also the personal uh, attorney for Malcolm X, uh, but Percy was born, uh, as were his other siblings, in that portion uh, there to the, to the left. Uh, so I want to encourage you again uh, in your work uh, and your studies to be uh, interdisciplinary uh, in your approach. Uh, what I've observed and learned is that uh, this, this can't just be done uh, with a single-minded uh, discipline or approach. Uh, the real information and uh, uh, the real interpretation comes from merging the different perspectives uh, of the different disciplines. Uh, as I've worked across the country, um, my observation is that uh, the underrepresentation of African-American resources uh, is uniform across the country. It's not unique just to the South or just to the North. Um, and if anybody, uh, as you do your research, if anybody tells you uh, we've, we've collected all the history and we know everything, uh, that's a red flag uh, because there's so much African American history that, that has not been researched and has not been interpreted uh, uh, in, in, some, in some places it's tragic. Um, some places the physical uh, erasure and demolition of uh, historic properties, buildings, and sites. Uh, again, it, it's just tragic. And um, if we can't save those physical places, at least we can save the documents, um, sometimes photographs, and the oral histories that uh, that represent them. Um, I think I've uh, given you enough to think about. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, pick up and answer questions and uh, uh, let Ms. Skipper uh, guide us through the rest of the presentation, but thank you for your attention. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Fly. You've given us a wealth of things uh, to think about, and this is certainly just a small fraction of the work that I'm sure you're doing and have done. And uh, one thing that your work about the with the Hockley uh, Cemetery caused me to think about is uh, the more recent or seeming more recent attention to um, the discovery of African American burial sites at times recovery and then sometimes discussions about de desecration of these sites. And it causes me to think about um, what maybe local or state laws that help us think about ownership and access to these sites, uh, who has the right to determine these sites futures, how are these conversations being had or how do you insert yourself in such conversations? Uh, well, th thanks for that, that question. Uh, Sometimes I, 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 I don't insert myself <laughs> in, the, in the case of uh, the Hockley, as I pointed out, um, Major Mike Wright, uh, you know, actually, who actually lives in the neighborhood, he discovered it. And Major Wright called me and asked if I would, if I would help. So um, he inserted me <laughs> into the project. Uh, and, and, but, but seriously, uh, what I try to do is be uh, respectful of, uh, uh, the, the people like in the, in the case of the Hockley, I'm, I'm not actually related to the Hockleys. Um, and so I made a, a great effort to, to carefully and respectfully meet with them, uh, call them and ask for permission uh, to do like the cleaning that I showed you. We asked for permission uh, before we started that. Um, they were actually good enough to, uh, some of the descendants live in Houston, some of them live in San Antonio, some of them live in other parts. And so they actually made an effort to come to San Antonio uh, on a particular time and date and sit down face to face. And of course, this was before COVID, mm -hmm. sit down face to face and uh, you know, let me explain how I could help and see if they wanted my help and uh, you know, come to an agreement. So we, I actually have a formal agreement uh, in writing with the family about what my roles and responsibilities are and, and you know, what they would like for me to do or not do, et cetera. But from there, uh, as I pointed out, uh, in San Antonio, we're, we're fortunate to have a long legacy in historic preservation. Um, and so we actually, as I said, we actually have a city office of historic preservation. The staff in the office of preservation, uh, in addition to the architectural historians, it, it includes uh, a, cultural hist a cultural historian, which is really remarkable for any city. Uh, we have three staff archeologists, uh, and then we have uh, a number of what we call program specialists. Uh, and so in San Antonio, that's what made it more easy for me is, is I could go to the Office of Preservation for official help and, uh, and support. And then of course, the City of San Antonio Office of Preservation put me in touch with the Texas Historical Commission, and every state has a, a state historic commission. Um, in Texas, uh, the way the cemetery, the cemeteries are handled is what we call uh, antiquities, and uh, that would involve uh, you know things that are buried, things that you would find buried, and uh, that allows you to work with even uh, indigenous. Uh, uh, artifacts and resources. Uh, and so uh, in Texas, under that Texas antiquities law, uh, once you bury a person, one person, it's a cemetery in perpetuity forever. And in order to, to um, remove that body, there's a whole set of criteria and requirements for forensic requirements, et cetera, health requirements, et cetera, that, that you have to follow. And so we were able to apply those laws and regulations to the Hockley Cemetery. Um, one thing I'd like to mention before I stop on the cemeteries is the, uh, uh, the, the National African-American uh, Burial Grounds Network Act that's under consideration um, uh, in the D Department of Interior right now. Um, if you don't know about that, you can, you can Google it and look it up, but uh, that's a, it's a bill that's been proposed uh, by two sitting uh, Congress people uh, that would establish a, a digital network so that as we discover these uh, 
lost and somewhat forgotten burial places, African-American burial places, we can create a catalog with GPS coordinates, um, history, and so forth. And so you, you're actually really correct, Ms. Jody, that there's been a lot uh, recently. I mean, every week now I get an email about another cemetery that's been discovered and uh, the same kind of questions, you know, what can you do? Um, how can you work? Uh, et cetera. But, but I always respect the family. That's my first uh, obligation and uh, a thought. And then from there, I would try to work with, uh, uh, like I said, the, the local ordinances and regulations and, and build out uh, so that these are protected. Thanks for that, Mr. Everett. One of our uh, viewers, Dorothy Abbott, wants to know if you've done any work with Love Cemetery in Texas. I, I don't recognize the name Love Cemetery. Uh, I'm not, you have to tell me what, what county or, or town is it near, but I don't recognize it. Okay. Dorothy, maybe you can follow up with a little bit more information if possible, and then we'll, we'll get back to that one. Right. Uh, another thing that I, I'm interested in thinking about is community building around historic preservation. And I, we see that you've had support from uh, archaeologists and, and from oral histories and, and many other different uh, types of access to people who have skill sets to help with this kind of work. And we might have uh, some folks who are watching who are interested in preserving a site or interested in supporting other people, but aren't quite sure how to get started. Do you have maybe any tips or best practices for people thinking about some of this work? Um, again, my, my best practice tip would be organize a team uh, because uh, in many cases this is there it's a bigger project than than one person can uh, you know handle individually and uh, what I've found is that the, the teams um, the teams usually come up with a lot of interesting networks and connections that uh, you can't imagine, like like on the Hockley, uh, we um, we wound up having more than more than twenty groups and organizations uh, to help us with that. And every group or every organization provided something that, uh, in some cases, I would have never thought of, you know, by myself. And this this has proved out as I've worked in different parts of the country um, uh, as well. Uh, so once the, for example, once the solid waste management said that they would uh, haul off the brush, then another group, uh, it was interesting, there, there, was, there were several groups of, uh, uh, they, I, they were, I, the best way I could describe it is they were uh, the, the, the exercise groups from the gymnasiums. They started calling and saying, you know, we can do that. We can use that as a, a cardio <laughs> a session, you know, the hauling and the dragging, the brush and so forth. And I'm serious. We had three or four groups that showed up on different days and, uh, you know, they just did it as a exercise, you know, physical aerobic exercise. Uh, and then we had another group, the, the uh, landscape contractors, uh, they provided a dumpster if we found like, um, uh, uh, bottles and debris. They provided a dumpster that we could use to haul, you know, haul that away. Uh, we had a, the, the community archive and museum had a lady that was a, a practical registered nurse. And so she said, well, we'll, we'll provide the first aid uh, when you're doing your cleanup. And so it, you know how they say it just all came together uh, and made it work. Uh, and so again, that's my observation from, from across the country. So start with the team. Uh, uh, again, contact your local, um, if it's building permit or uh, waste solid waste management group and figure out how to go about it. Uh, there are specialists, uh, you might note that there are specialists, uh, people that just work with um, masonry and headstone restoration. So if you have markers, that that's real important. Uh, and I, this is a real quick and I'll I'll stop, Ms. Jody. We had one, one uh, case uh, where there was a, another cemetery and there was a broken headstone and uh, the people were well-meaning in the neighborhood and they wanted to uh, uh, see if they could glue the pieces back together with Gorilla Glue. 
And so we had to tell them, no, don't, don't do that because it, it, it'll do more damage to the material than, you know, than your help. And so we were able to actually find them uh, experts in uh, uh, stonework and masonry and um, uh, headstone uh, preservation and to get it done the right way. Thanks for that, Mr. Paul. Uh, another question that I have is actually, you mentioned activism and you also mentioned a social justice around African-American historic preservation. And I've, I've noticed that, you know, through this more recent movement for Black Lives, you're getting more conversations with institutions like the National Trust and also the Mellon Foundation that's starting to think about um, monuments and memorialization and how to think about African-American heritage sites. Uh, do you have any advice on maybe uh, some things that we can think about as we have these types of conversations since you've seen so much change over time? Um, again, the thing I, I would say about uh, approaching the, the foundations is to make, make sure your, one is to make sure your research is, is thorough. Um, you know, even if it's just a, a single site. Uh, because they have so many uh, proposals and applications that come their way, they don't have time to do the, the background or on the ground or the detail research. So if your team, I'm back to my tips, if your team can include, uh, and there are people, um, volunteers that are happy to you know, work on things like this because a, a lot of the research now you can do uh, online. Uh, of course, there's some you can't, but a lot you can do online. So if you can research the, you know, the deeds and the history and the records and, and make sure that, uh, that you have a really, that your interpretation of those deeds and records is as deep as it is broad, then when you go to the trust, it helps you make your case. You can, you can say this is really significant because, and you've got your documentation uh, you, you know, backed up um, and then um, again, as, as best you can, if you can make connections uh, either to your whole town, uh, you know, like at the example I gave of Samuel Sutton, uh, of course, we know he was one of the early school teachers, but what we did was we traced Samuel and his children, you know, what were their, what were their interconnected legacies. And so that helped us because if you go to the trust, it's a national organization. And of course, they're interested in your local story, but they also want to know, uh, in a broader context, you know, statewide or regional or national, what might be the co connections that would make your proposal uh, unique. Thanks for that, Mr. Claude. And it looks like we have a, an update from Dorothy that of Love Cemetery. She says it's in Harrison County. She read a book about it, Love Cemetery: Unburying the Secret History of Slaves uh, by China Gallon. Does that sound familiar? Um, uh, Harrison County or Harris? It, it, it might be Harris County. It might be because they, uh, I guess you might recall a couple of years ago, uh, the state was building, uh, starting construction of a, a state facility and they uncovered more than a hundred uh, African American graves and they had to stop uh, construction and uh, decide what to do or how to do they were they were proposing to to uh, move the bodies and you heard me talk about the, the process uh, that they would have had to follow but um, I still the, the name I'm writing it down I'm going to look it up after we after we get through but uh, the name doesn't strike a strike a bell you, you, you have to remember there are 254 counties in Texas <laughs> so I, I don't claim to know every <laughs> Uh, every every uh, county, but um, I have done some broad research between uh, where I am in San Antonio and and East Texas is actually where my uh, where my grandparents are from, deep East Texas. So, but I, I'll look it up. Thanks for that. And and while I have you here, Mr. Fly, I'm going to take the liberty and ask a, a pretty personal question about um, the Alamo complex in San Antonio and whether you oh. can kind of talk about. Uh, some of the work around that. I know that it's a, a big question, but uh, you know, I certainly learned, I think, relatively early in graduate school that um, there were a lot more diverse folks in the Alamo compound, and our historical memory doesn't necessarily reflect that. And there are a lot of issues around that in the preservation of 
of historic sites. Can you talk about that one? Uh, let's see if I can keep it under three minutes. <laughs> so of course the people recognize the Alamo, um, the, the Battle in um, March of 1836 uh, is considered the kind of one of the watersheds in the, the battle for Texas liberty, uh, uh, liberty from Mexico. Uh, but what, as you pointed out, Ms. Jody, what many people don't realize is that that there were African Americans in the, the ex exploratory groups of the Spanish conquistadores that came to Texas in the 1700s. There were Africans in those groups. Uh, and so by the time when you get to the Alamo in 1836, uh, not only do you have uh, slaves, of course, in Texas, but you have a number of free black Texans that participated in, in, in fighting. Uh, many people don't know the first person wounded in the Texas Revolution was a black man. And his name was Samuel McCulloch. And Samuel was, was wounded in, actually wounded in 1835. I don't have the exact date um, uh, right in front of me, but uh, he was wounded in 1835. Uh, and then the battles, the different fights continued and worked their way up to San Antonio. Uh, and then uh, after the, at, at the Alamo, uh, there were, uh, Colonel Travis had a slave uh, there at the Alamo. Uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Mr. Dickinson had a slave at the Alamo. There were, they weren't documented because slaves at that time, of course, were chattel. They were property. Uh, just like you'd own a horse or a cow or a rifle, that, that's the way they considered slaves. Uh, part, part of the reason, not the whole reason, but a big part of the reason that, uh, that the white or Anglo and even some of the Hispanic defenders were fighting against Mexico was, was that the Texans wanted to keep the right to hold slaves, okay? And uh, that hasn't come out, as you said, until recently. Um, and so I'm gonna fast forward um, so that to uh, still have some time for questions. Uh, so that was 1836. Uh, and so the Alamo sits, it, the Alamo sits on one of San Antonio's three or, or four main public plazas uh, downtown. And, uh, uh, it's actually been discussed over about 20 years of a plan to recover what was the, they call it the, the stockade, uh, the outline of the fence or, or um, uh, defense uh, fence around the Alamo. And uh, the one group feels like that's the only story that should be told. Uh, my personal feeling is that we need to tell the whole story because the out, what became Alamo Plaza also has a civil rights history and a civil rights story because it's a public plaza. Uh, for example, um, there were black folks that owned land on Alamo Plaza, what's now Alamo Plaza, before the Alamo. There was, there was a, a mixed race man named Felipe Eloa and Mr. Eloa owned property, it would be at the southwest corner of what is now Alamo Plaza. Uh, so that would have been in the 1830s. Uh, then I fast forward uh, to uh, the 1860s and there was a, a slave auction house at the south end of what we now know as Alamo Plaza. Uh, then after 1865, uh, the custom in San Antonio was to, if you had a public issue, whether you were black or Hispanic or, or white, uh, was to have uh, uh, asked for a permit or asked for a right to give your speech or talk on Alamo Plaza or Main Plaza or one of the plazas. In the 1880s, uh, 1886, as a matter of fact, there was a black group, an African-American group that asked to have a public discussion on Alamo Plaza uh, believe it or not, they were talking about prohibition, uh, the right to sell alcohol. And so the black group asked to have the, um, uh, the meeting, the mayor, white mayor said no, that he would not allow them to have the meeting uh, 
but on the north end of the plaza is a uh, where our where our federal old federal courthouse was located. Uh, the black folks had enough presence. They asked the U.S. government to hold the event on their property since the city wouldn't allow it. When the black folks showed up to have their meeting, a group of white folks showed up and physically uh, assaulted the black group, and they chased them a mile across downtown San Antonio uh, to the to the AME church. As a result of that, uh, the mayor, uh, the sheriff, and two former city council members were indicted under federal charges of denying free speech to Americans. And in that case, it was the Afro-American group. So there's a whole civil rights history there that uh, to me, it's just as important as the Alamo you know, as an individual story. So let me stop there. Uh, there's, a, there's a coalition group uh, I'm working with, a, it's, a, it's called the a Coalition to Save the Woolworth. And we're working to tell the whole story uh, because the Woolworth, uh, 1920s Woolworth building sits on the Northwest corner of the plaza. And of course, that was one of the first uh, lunch counters to be desegregated in San Antonio. So there's layers and layers of civil rights history. There's layers and layers of uh, Republic of Texas history. Uh, there's layers of cultural history there. And it's just important that we tell, as I say it, the whole story. Thanks for that, Mr. Saul. Okay, we'll take one more call for, for questions for folks just in case because time is running short for us. We'll take one more call for questions. Okay, well, if there are no more, I will say thank you so much, Mr. Fly. You have a wealth of knowledge and, and you adequately covered so many complicated issues and, and so much depth. <laughs> I know in a very accessible way for us. A lot of us are thinking about these issues. So it's really helpful to have you here to help us think through this. And we also thank, thank folks who are on the other end who are watching on behalf of the Center for the Southern Study of Southern Culture. Uh, who are here to share in our South Talks program. And I think that Afton might post some additional information for some upcoming uh, talks for folks to see. And um, so I'll give Mr. Fly a hand <laughs> and give a final thank, thank, thank you for you. having me and uh, everybody stay safe. Wear your mask. <laughs> yes, <please. laughs> Bye. Thank you.